All right. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and watching this presentation. Uh, Engage at EMU has partnered with the Washtenaw County chapter of the League of Women Voters to offer this um, ballot proposals and election process, what you need to know webinar. And joining us today to share this information with you is the wonderful Joan Sampieri. Joan, <laughs> ready to take it away. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you for attending. Um, I'm Joan Sampieri, as Tyler said. I, I'm the immediate past president of the League of Women Voters of Washtenaw County, and currently I serve as the membership chair. The League is a nonpartisan and um, non-political, uh, rather political organization, but nonpartisan. We don't ever endorse candidates or um, parties. And so today's presentation, which is I'm representing the League of Women Voters Education Fund Board in Michigan, the total Michigan League of Women Voters. We wanted to give you a brief overview about three of the statewide proposals on the ballot this November. And because there's a heightened interest in election security these days, I'm also going to briefly cover Michigan's election laws. The presentation is brought to you by the League of Women Voters Education Fund of Michigan that works to register and provide voters with election information throughout the election process. Um, we have a resource, vote411.org, that has printed voter guides, candidate forums, and debates. The League never supports, as I said, or opposes candidates or political parties. This is a totally educational presentation. I'll be presenting both sides of the issue as best as possible. So Tyler, if you can take the next slide, please. In addition to the three ballot proposals, there are several statewide offices on the ballot. There are the US House of Representatives, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state, the attorney general, the a state senator, uh, your state senator, and your state representative. Next, please, Tyler. Many communities will, awful, awful, will also have local offices and possibly local ballot proposals as well. Uh, Tyler, you're, I think you're one step ahead of me. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so we, we, you'll be looking for those on your ballot as well as the proposals and the state elected office. Next slide, please. We're fortunate in Michigan and one of very few states, well, about half the states to have a constitution that gives two powers to the voters that not every state provides. The first is called legislative initiative and gives voters the right, if certain conditions are met, to initiate legislation, that's the laws, and a second power to amend the Michigan Constitution, which is extremely important. A constitutional amendment. Nothing in the Constitution may be altered without the approval of voters. Any action by a legislature to amend the Constitution in Michigan must be passed uh, must be placed on a ballot and passed by the voters, which is a really wonderful thing for us. There are three statewide ballot proposals to amend the Constitution that all Michiganders will be voting on. Their transparency and term limits, promote the vote 2022, and reproductive freedom for all. Please note, if any of these pass, they go into effect 45 days after they're approved by the voters. Next slide, please. You'll see on your ballot that there is 22-1, transparency and term limits. This proposal was placed on the ballot by a two thirds vote of the Michigan legislature. Therefore, no signatures were required. Ordinarily, all of us as citizens and voters in, in Michigan, mostly as absolutely as voters in Michigan, must sign um, proposals to get something onto the Michigan ballot for a change to the Constitution. 
But in this instance, the legislature placed this on the ballot. And remember that no changes to the Constitution can happen without our vote. Before um, reading the 100 page, 100 word ballot summary, I'm going to refer you to the handout that Tyler has posted for you. Is this one that you're talking about? Yes, it is. Cool. You should have seen this, and this should be something you can easily print at home or at the college so that you have in your hand some information about those ballot proposals. And I'm going to run through them for you, but this is a this is for you a handy cheat sheet as we go forward. Um, so this proposed constitutional amendment, oops, <laughs> I don't want you seeing my notes because then then you'll know everything that I'm going to tell you. Uh, my um, apologies, I have to um, play it from the slide when I go in. It, it I know. The presentation. I know. Well, and it wouldn't kill anybody if, if they saw my notes. They would just know that I don't know everything by heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, and there will be no test after this, right? <laughs> Absolutely <Okay. not. laughs> uh, The test is when you get into the voting booth. Yes, right. <laughs> so this proposal, uh, consti const this proposed constitutional amendment would require members of the legislature the governor, the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state, the attorney and the attorney general to file annual public financial disclosure reports after 2023, including their assets, liabilities, income sources, future employment agreements, gifts, travel reimbursements, and positions held in organizations, except for those that are religious, social, or political organizations. It would require the legislature to implement, but not limit or restrict reporting requirements. And it would require the current term limits for state representatives and state senators with a 12 year total limit in any combination between the House and the Senate, except for a person elected in the Senate to the Senate in 2022, who may be elected the number of times shown that were allowed when that person was elected. And I know that that's a lot to take in, which is why we've given you the cheat sheet. I'm gonna review a little bit more about this, but that those are the basics. The entire wording for the constitutional amendment is available at the State Board of Canvassers website or transparency and term limits. And that information is on the handout as well so that you can follow up and do a little bit more research if you'd like. You might want to read the entire proposal. Will you go to the next slide, please, Tyler? Michigan's legislature has failed to pass any legislation regarding financial transparency for elected officials. Michigan's current legislative term limits permit three terms in the House of Representatives or six years and two terms in the Senate, eight years for a total of 14 years. We've had term limits over the last 30 years adopted in 1992 by voters. In the 90s, various states adopted term limits for state offices. Federal offices are not limited by our constitution because it would have to be an amendment to the US constitution. 15 states have term limits now. Michigan's one of five states with lifetime term limits. Um, and you can find that again at the website. Um, and you'll find more information at something called ballotpedia.org, which is a wonderful source about everything that's on our ballot and everybody else's. They follow just about everything in the whole wide world. Next slide, please, Tyler. So why might we need to have transparency as a constitutional amendment? Supporters say that Michigan ranks 50th in the nation in transparency. Michigan and Idaho are the only two states in the country 
that don't require personal financial disclosure by their state elected officials. This is a major reason that the Center for Public Integrity ranks the state of Michigan as 50th in the nation in transparency. The Michigan legislature has discussed various bills to require this, um, but none has passed. If passed, beginning in 2024, elected legislature and state executive office officials must file annual financial disclosure reports on their income, their assets, their liabilities, their gifts from lobbyists, their promotions, uh, positions held in certain organizations, and agreements for future employment, and they must file that with the Secretary of State. Insofar as term limits, after 2022, people could not be elected to, to terms in the Michigan House of Representatives or Michigan Senate for terms that total more than 12 years. A person could serve 12 years in the Senate, which would be three four-year terms, or 12 years in the House, which would be six two-year terms, or a combination of the two not to exceed 12 years. And that's for our Michigan legislation legislature. A 12 year lifetime term would keep the benefits of term limits, but would allow house members to focus on the serious work of legislation and not be forced to look at the chamber where they might be next elected. Gone would be the pressure to immediately start seeking out the next position. Next, please, Tyler. Some supporters include um, <clears throat> the American Federation of Teachers of Michigan, Femmes for Dems, the League of Women Voters of Michigan, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, the Michigan Ed Education Association, the Michigan Farm Bureau, Michigan Manufacturers Association, Michigan Realtors, Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters and Millwrights, and the Sierra Club. There is some opposition to this. If you'd take the next slide, Tyler. Um, let me see, I'm on the same one. Yep, come on. <laughs> Opponents say, um, that the proposals have attacked the rapid state proposals have attacked the rapid state lawmakers rapid vote state lawmakers cast in May that placed this measure on the ballot. Remember that this did not come from supporters uh, voters. This came from the state legislature, and some opponents say that this happened too rapidly, and some opponents are calling it an ambush. Some opponents have argued that the proposal was drafted by politicians and lobbyists who make money off their connections to government. Next slide, Tyler. We've found two uh, groups opposed to this, the Term Limits Defense Fund and the US Term Limits. You'll see on your screen, termlimitsdefensefund.org, and that's also on your handout. I do not have a link for US term limits. I don't think that we have found one, but they're, they are an organization that opposes this. Um, Tyler, if you'd go to the next slide, please. So this is 22-2 proposal. Um, <clears throat> This is a proposal to amend the state constitution to add provisions regarding elections. It would, if passed, recognize the fundamental right to vote without harassing conduct, require military or overseas ballots be counted if postmarked by election day, provide voter rights to verify identity with a voter ID photo ID or signed statement, require state funded absentee ballot drop boxes and postage for absentee application and ballots. Provide that only election officials may conduct post-election audits, require nine days of 
early in-person voting, allow donations to fund elections, but those donations would have to be disclosed, require canvas boards as a, to certify the election results based only on the official records of the votes cast. Should this proposal be adopted, yes or no? The entire wording for this constitutional amendment, again, can be found at the State Board of Canvassers or at Promote the Vote 2022's website, both of which are on your handout. So let's look a little bit further. Next one, please, Tyler. Currently, Michigan voters pass the, currently, because Michigan voters passed Promote the Vote in 2018, we put a lot of voter rights into the Michigan Constitution. Michigan has various laws that regulate voting that can be changed by the legislature. Remember that the constitutional amendments cannot. Voting rights are, that are in the Constitution, again, can't be changed except by the rights of, of voters. Next slide, please. So, supporters say, oh, I went back a slide, sorry. Um, supporters say that this will help ensure that every voice is heard and that every vote is counted in every election, no matter what political party or candidate we support, where we live or what we look like. It says that voting is critical to the integrity of our democracy, which is why our fundamental voting rights should be respected and protected in Michigan's constitution. They say that Promote the Vote 2022 would recognize those fundamental votes, fundamental right to vote without harassing, without any harassing con uh, conduct. Promote the Vote will enhance election integrity and increase election security by modernizing how the elections are administered in order to ensure that every vote counts. By voting yes, supporters say that you can ensure our elections are fair, accurate, and secure, and that election results are determined based on the votes voters of Michigan citizens whose identity has been verified prior to counting their vote and whether they are voting in person or by mail. Promote the Vote supporters also say that it provides voters the right to verify their identity with a photo ID or a signed statement, which is the same as we do today. Promote the Vote said, supporters say that it will make voting more convenient and accessible for Michiganders of all backgrounds. It would require that military and overseas ballots would be counted if they're postmarked by election day. And it would provide voters the right to a single application to vote absentee in all elections. So let's look, Tyler, at uh, the next slide. Some supporters include the ACLU, the American Federation of Teachers in Michigan, Common Cause, Equality Michigan, the Gray Panthers, the League of Women Voters of Michigan, the Michigan AFL-CIO, and the NAACP. Let's move, Tyler, to what opponents have to say. Opponents believe that the claim that the measure would open the door to abuse. And they've been opposed to wide expansion of absentee voting because of security and cost concerns. It is incumbent upon us to look at both sides of this issue and you'll find on your um, handout where you can see more information about opponents' concerns. Some opponents include uh, next slide, please, Tyler. Defend your ballot, unborn equity and voting integrity, secure my vote, and stand up Michigan. And you'll see again up in the box that secure my vote is secure mivote.org 
is a link for you to find out the art more of the discussion of the opponents. Next slide, please. So we come to 22-3, re Reproductive Freedom for All. This is a proposal to amend the state constitution to establish new individual rights to reproductive freedom, including the right to make all decisions about pregnancy and abortion uh, uh, that allow the state, but allow the state to regulate abortion in some cases and forbid prosecution of individuals exercising the established right. This proposal, proposed constitutional amendment would establish new individual rights to reproductive freedom, including the right to make and carry out all decisions about pregnancy, such as prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraception, sterilization, abortion, miscarriage management, and infertility. It would allow the state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, but not prohibit it medically if needed to protect a patient's life or her, her physical or mental health. It would forbid state discrimination in enforcement of this right, prohibit prosecution of an individual or a person helping a pregnant individual for exercising these rights established by the, the amendment. And it would invalidate the state laws conflicting with this amendment. And on your ballot, you will see, should this proposal be adopted, yes or no. Again, the entire wording of the constitutional amendment is available at the State Board of Canvassers. What you'll see on your ballot is just the language that the State Board of Canvassers has approved, which is a hundred word summary. If you want to read the full thing, then um, that's available at the State Board of Canvassers website or Reproductive Freedom for All's website, and you will find that again on your handout. Proposal three went on to the ballot by signature of voters in, um, in Michigan. It turned in over 735,000 signatures of the needed 425,059. Tyler, if you would take the next slide, please. Um, on June 24th, 2022, and this is what is currently here in Michigan, the US Supreme Court overturned the landmark Roe v. Wade decision in a six to three vote. Almost half a century ago, the Roe v. Wade ruling was the basis for establishing a constitutional right to abortion. Um, the ruling means that the states must decide what the laws will be in regulating abortion. And that's where Michigan enters this picture. In Michigan, we have a 1931 law that bans abortion, but the courts have issued an injunction on that law so that abortion with certain restrictions are still allowed here. In 2020, 18% of all pregnancies in Michigan resulted in an abortion. 15% resulted in a miscarriage. Those under 18 accounted for just 2% of abortions in Michigan. Next slide, please, Tyler. Supporters of this proposal say that it's needed because important medical decisions should be guided by a patient's health and well being, not by a politician's beliefs. But for far too long, according to, a, to supporters, politicians across the country have been fighting to restrict reproductive health care, and now they're gaining ground. Now, in the US, now with the US Supreme Court and its overturning of Roe v. Wade, Supporters remind us that a 1931 Michigan law could go back into effect that would make abortion illegal and threaten doctors with prison for up to 15 years for providing an abortion. 
In addition to supporting access to a broad range of reproductive health care, this amendment would make would make sure that no one goes to prison for providing safe medical care. When people are able to make decisions about their own reproductive health, supporters feel that include, including whether and when to have children, they have more control over their health and their um, economic security. Specifically, supporters feel that the measure will ensure that all Michiganders have the right to safe and respectful, respectful care during birthing, and that everyone has the right to use temporarily or permanent birth control, and has the right to continue or end a pregnancy pre-viability, and that no one can be punished for having a miscarriage, a stillbirth, or an abortion. So let's look, Tyler, at who support the supporters are. Some of them include the American Civil Liberties Union of Michigan, the American Association of University Women, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, the Center for Reproductive Rights, the League of Women Voters of Michigan, the Michigan Nurses Association, Michigan Voters, National Council of Jewish Women, and Planned Parenthood Advocates of Michigan. Next slide, please, Tyler. <clears throat> Opponents say that the Michigan law that bans abortion except to save the life of the mother and make it a felony to perform an abortion should continue to be the law. The 1931 law bans the abortion except for the life of the month to save the life of the mother and makes it a felony to, to perform that. Opponents of this, this um, proposal feel that it should continue to be the law. This amendment, the opponents feel, should repeal, would repeal dozens of state laws, including the state's ban on tax-funded abortions, on partial birth abortions, and fundamentally alter the parent-child relationships by preventing parents from having input into their children's health. You can find more about their concerns at HTTPS support my MI women and children org. Let's take a look at who some of the opponents of this are. Some opponents include Citizens for Support My Women and Children, Alliance for Life West Michigan, American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Citizens for Traditional Values, Michigan Catholic Conference, the Michigan Family Forum, Michigan Knights of Columbus, and the Rights to Life of Michigan. It would be helpful as you make your decision to look at look more fully into what both the supporters and the opponents say in order to make that just fully informed decision. So let's look at the next slide. Yep. We'll take questions if, if that's okay with Tyler at the end. Um, do you want to put that when we're all finished? Do you want people to put them in the chat or do you want them live or when we're <clears throat> all the way at the end? Yeah, that's totally fine. If they want to um, put them in the chat, when uh, also if people want to add comments um, to the video itself and leave questions in the comments, um, we can respond to them that way as well. Good. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Let me get back into it. Okay. So we're on to part two, the election process. Um, We'll switch to that part of this presentation and talk about the process of, of our elections in Michigan. We'll focus on three key fa factors, recognizing, uh, registering to vote, not recognize, registering to vote, absentee voting, and how our elections are certified. Let's take a look first, Tyler, at um, registration. <clears throat> You'll see on your screen that there are two pieces to this. Through the 15th day before the election, 
which this year is October 24th, you have a whole lot of options. You can register to vote by mail, in person at the Secretary of State's office, at the county township or county clerk's office, at city or township or the county clerk's office, at voter registration agencies, or during a voter registration drive like the League of Women Voters holds, or online. You can actually register to vote online at the Secretary of State's website. From the 14th day before the election, which this year is um, hmm, the day after, which would be the 25th of October, <clears throat> you have one option. You must go to your clerk's office or satellite office, and you must take proof of your residency. That can be a water bill, um, a credit card bill, something like that that shows that you live at the address where you wish to be registered. Tyler, let's look at the next slide, please. Once you've registered to vote, you may consider absentee voting. You can do it in person, which seems a little strange, but it's actually an option. You can visit your city or township clerk's office. You can submit a completed application in person. You can vote the ballot while you're standing there and vote, hand the absentee ballot vote to the, to the clerk in person. It won't be counted until the election, um, but it will be in and you will have voted. Or you can take the absentee ballot home once you've applied for it and gotten it, vote it at home, and then drop it back off or mail it back. You have a second option there or a third one. Um, submit a completed application for an absentee ballot by mail. You'll find that at your clerk on your clerk's website. An absentee ballot will be provided by mail. I got mine today. Um, you can mail that ballot after you've completed it. You can mail it back or drop it off to the clerk in a drop box or at the clerk's office. One critical issue, you must sign the ballot envelope. People sometimes forget this with your official signature in order for the ballot to count. Ballots must be received, even if they're absentee, by 8 p.m. on election day. So at 7.50 on election day, you could walk in and hand the clerk your absentee ballot if you needed to. Next slide, please, Tyler. Why would you want to vote absentee? Well, the advantages of absentee ballots are there are no lines. There are no hours. Um, you can vote when it's convenient. You don't need a ride to the polls. And there's time to study the choices, which is part of why we're doing this presentation, so that you have time to consider. For the August primary in 2022, this last August, State Elections Director Jonathan Brader said that about 2.1 million voters participated in the election and that slightly over half voted absentee. It's convenient and it does give you time to look at what you wanna vote for. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Once the election's over, it becomes the business of the County Board of Canvassers, which is charged with certifying the elections. There are four members of the County Board, two Democrats and two Republicans with staggered four-year terms. They're appointed by the County Board of Commissioners from names supplied by both parties. They have several duties. Within 14 days of the election, they must meet. They have to review the election paperwork from each of the precincts in the, in the county. They must certify the election results in the county and a majority of the vote is needed to certify. They must send the election certification report then to the State Board of Canvassers. 
Their meetings are open to the public to observe, but not to participate. Trained league members observe meetings and report any ir Ill irregularities. I've attended these and they're very interesting. And I watched the last presidential election when our board of canvassers worked together to diligently make sure that every vote was counted. And they did it in a very collegial fashion. It was something really good to watch. Um, those reports then go to the State Board of Canvassers. Next slide, please, Tyler. And again, there are four members, two Democrats and two Republicans with staggered four-year terms. They're appointed by the governor from names provided by the two parties. They have several duties. They must meet within six weeks of the election. They meet to review the election certification reports from every one of our 83 counties. They certify the election results. And again, a majority vote is needed to certify. Their meetings are also open to the public to observe, but not to participate. Trained league members observe meetings and report their irregularities. Um, during just before the um, August primary, we could watch their meetings on Zoom and they may be able to do that again so that all of us can participate if we wish. Well, can watch, not participate. <laughs> um, next slide, please, Tyler. Now, oh, oh, will you go to the next one? Thank you. Because on my slides, I reversed them because this didn't make sense to me. Um, we've talked about being an informed voter and that's why I'm doing this presentation. And that's why we've talked a little bit about absentee ballot proposal, uh, ballots so that you have the time to see what's on your ballot and consider what you want to vote for. Before we take questions and before I do one more thing after this, um, I'm going to encourage you to check out the League's online voter guide. It's vote411.org. By entering your zip code, you'll be able to learn about the candidates and the issues in your district. This is actually available throughout the United States. So if you have friends or family living somewhere else, they can look at their ballot information wherever they live. You'll see what's on your ballot. We'll see if we've done forums with these candidates, and you'll see answers that they've given the League of Women Voters about their stand on particular issues. So will you go back one slide, please, Tyler? Voter resources. Michigan Secretary of State. You can register to vote there. You can find out, you can make sure that you're registered to vote. You can see where your polling place is. Both the Secretary of State and Vote411 can give you that information. Michiganvoting.org can, can help you make your way through the ballot. ballot. And again, Vote411 can take you a walk through your own personal ballot. And now, if there are any questions, I will try to answer. And if I don't know the answer, I promise not to make it up. I will find out and get back to Tyler. I am curious, you know, for somebody who is, and you might not know the answer to this, but for somebody who, um, you know, has maybe like visual impairment um, and isn't able to read the ballot, is there a way for them to either get support at the poll or through absentee to vote? Yes. At the polls, you can ask for an assistant. Um, you can either have somebody there or you can have someone who comes with you. And you can tell the clerk at the polls that you need help reading the ballot. It's better if you do that, if you have an opportunity with an absentee ballot so that you're not, I mean, it's probably better for the voter to have the time to consider everything, but we do make those accommodations. And I don't recall, Tyler, if there is a, a voice connection to our voting machines. I'll, mm -hmm. look for, I'll look at that, but I don't know. In other states where I have lived, there has been 
okay. the ability to plug in. But I honestly can't tell you because I mostly vote absentee. Yeah. And that's an important question. No, okay. That's, I was just, yeah, I was super interested to know that. And I hadn't seen any of like the plugins before, but I also haven't been looking for it. So I might have missed it if it was there. And if if it's not something you need, as I don't and you don't, it might not be something we would consider, but it would be very important because it could it could keep a voter from casting a ballot if they didn't feel that they could see it. Totally. That's a that's a good point. Okay. Um you know, is there anything else that you think is just helpful for maybe um first time voters to know? Um, if there's anything that might be like keeping them from participating or, um, you know, getting information so they can participate. It's been a long time since I was a first time voter. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And and when I was a first time voter, I had to be 21. I couldn't vote at 18. Um, we didn't change that constitutionally until, um, as we have with many rights to vote, until citizens said, wait, if I'm old enough to go to war, I should be old enough to have a voice in it. And that's what happened. Um, so I, I can see that feeling unprepared or un... And, and that happens even if you're not a first time voter. It's, it's worrisome if you're looking at a long ballot with a lot of questions and people you don't know, how do you decide how to make that, dis that choice? You could, at the top of your ballot, vote straight party ticket. And that would be either Republican or Democrat. You can, because Michigan allows it, even if you vote straight party ticket, cross over and vote for somebody in the other party, which sometimes is confusing. But you can either, you can go down the whole ballot and click, 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 or you can choose one party or the other. But once you're finished with the party candidates, there are a whole list beyond that of nonpartisan candidates. And they're also crucial to what you need to make a decision about. A lot of school board members running for the local school boards are nonpartisan. In many communities, um, the, the races for clerk or um, other positions might be nonpartisan. I believe that Celine has nonpartisan candidates for its uh, supervisor, for its clerk. So you might be clicking down ballot, but you might miss the people in your own community. So you wanna make sure that you vote in your own community and you know who they are. Beyond that are our judges who are critical parts of our lives. We're looking at the three pieces of our democracy which by the way, a majority of Americans can't tell you who they are. They are our executive branch, our legislative branch, and our judicial branch. And the majority of Americans could not answer that question. So you will have voted for the partisan people and maybe gotten down to your nonpartisan, maybe you know your local community and you will have voted for people in your local community. Maybe you don't know who's on the school board and you probably really don't know who's who the judges are. We're voting for Supreme Court justices in our state this year. Mm -hmm. And you might not have any clue who they are. And yet, because they're nonpartisan, you will not have known anything about them. That's where the league's vote 411 comes in handy because we will have reached out to everyone who is running for office and said, here are some questions we have. A, would you answer the questions and we'll put them in print and it's available digitally, digitally here in Washtenaw County and in many other jurisdictions in the state. The league has also done forums, candidate forums where opposing candidates can sit and talk about their positions 
and introduce themselves to the voters. And they're available on our YouTube channel. The State League um, did a forum of the, um, I believe the governor, the lieutenant governor, and maybe the attorney general, but I can't recall. You'll find all of that at the League of Women Voters. Uh, if you go, if you just Google League of Women Voters Washington, you'll be able to find all that stuff. Being an informed voter is the most important thing for us so that you don't get to the polls and not know anything. And so that you get to the polls knowing who should represent you and who's going to make decisions about your life as a, a judge, as a school board member, as your community person, and as our other elected officials. So that's what we aim to do. When the League was founded 102 years ago, we thought we would be in business only a short period of time. We were founded because women were getting the, sh the right to vote, which they'd never had before. And we thought, well, we will educate this first batch of women and our job will be finished. <laughs> 102 years later, it's not. So we're still here and still educating as much as we possibly can. Well, I'm super thankful that you all are here and doing this work because it's it's amazing how many resources there really are out there to learn about those names that are on the ballots and those proposals and to really make sure that like when you get there, you know what choices you're making because those are some really significant and important choices for you and your community. So thank you. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> I appreciated the invitation. It's been a pleasure working with you. It has. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to stop recording now unless there's anything else that you want to share with us before we end. I think that's it. Thank cool. you.